Hi, I'm Cory, and I have too many tapes. Disney World is a shortcut to joy for me. It's kind of inexplicable, but it draws me in like a moth to a flame. And I'm not even that huge of a Disney fan. Sure, I love animation, but I don't crow over the Disney canon. I don't have Mickey Mouse plastered all over my walls. I think Walt Disney is innovative, but I find him to be basically entirely despicable in all other ways. And yet I find myself returning to Disney World whenever I get a chance. Once every few years, whenever I can save up the money. I guess I would classify myself as a Disney Parks fan. I mean, I do have a shelf of Haunted Mansion stuff, and I did propose to my wife in line for that ride, so there is an emotional thread that ties us there. But it also connects to when I was a kid. Disney would send a videotape like this whenever you requested vacation information as a way to entice you and seal the deal. When my parents told my sister and I that we were going on a Disney vacation when we were little, they handed us this tape as a way to get us excited. And we'd watch this tape over and over and over again as the trip got closer. And as commercials for Disney vacations, they were incredibly effective. These videos are just enchanting. A calm and pleasant voice describes to you in tantalizing detail all of the wonders that await you. And they're filmed in a lush and plucky 90s style that was a hallmark of Disney productions back then. And most importantly, they're just filled to the brim with awkward families trying to sound authentic on camera under pressure. Well, they were really thrilled that he came up and he shook their hand and they ruffled their hair and signed the autograph books and hugged them all and my daughter cried. We've been here four years in a row, so we like it. Yep, yep. The value is phenomenal. We wouldn't go anywhere else. I love Walt Disney World. I love it. She's been talking about wanting to see Mickey and Minnie the whole time. The whole way down here. I can't wait to see them. I would recommend that every parent bring their kids to Walt Disney World. It's just the best there is. It's really kind of neat. It's good for everybody. Mmm, horrible 90s fashion. But this isn't really about these tapes. Not in a direct way, at least. It's about what they promised. Disney World promised magic, wonder, and discovery, balanced with craftsmanship, order, and structure. One side of Disney magic lies in spontaneity. Turning the corner and seeing Mickey Mouse, the thrills of Space Mountain, an adventure around the world in Epcot, these tapes sold a world where everything was waiting for you. The other half of Disney magic lies in the completeness of the experience. It's all taken care of, every need accounted for, every taste catered to. Look at all these options. All you have to do is pick. But over the years, something has changed. What was once an impossible cocktail of controlled spontaneity has become a vortex of anxiety and expectations. It's become a series of hurdles and checkpoints and gated experiences that all work together to flatten the magic. Let's talk about why. If you want to, you can plan your Disney vacation down to the minute, and Disney makes it all too easy to do so. And you have to plan. A lot of Disney experiences book up the moment they become available. So it all goes a little like this. A year or so out, you decide you're going to Disney World. This is when you start looking for deals and hoping that the hotel you want isn't full. If you stay off-site, it's a lot cheaper, but you have to worry about transportation, parking, and a huge pain, exclusivity. You see, if you're staying at one of Disney World's hotels, you get early access to dining reservations and fast passes. This creates a rigid hierarchy, two classes, those who have access and those who don't. So, craving that access, you plunk down a sizable deposit on a Disney hotel. And let's address this early on. Disney vacations are unbelievably expensive. Irresponsibly so. It's a wild privilege to be even able to go to Disney World, let alone stay on site, so I get how this video can come across as a massive first world problem. That being said, how anyone affords to stay at deluxe hotels sort of boggles the imagination. I feel like a bougie dillweed staying at Pop Century, and it's one of their more affordably priced hotels. But that's beside the point. After you book your trip comes this window of uncertainty. You stare out onto the vast horizon of your calendar, and you see that magical date looming in the distance. It seems so far away, but there's so much to do. It's all so overwhelming. Who can you trust to help you? Well, don't panic, because there's an entire subgenre of YouTube videos to help fill that anxiety hole. The rise of the Disney Parks YouTuber has been fascinating to see over the last decade. There are so many different flavors. From the purely experiential, vicarious enjoyment of someone like Tim Tracker, to the almost daily list makers over at Disney Food Blog, there's almost certainly a Disney YouTuber to fit your taste. The one thing that all these channels have in common, though? Lots of opinions. They all have their proprietary lists of what they think the best experiences are, so you start comparing and contrasting. Thinking about eating at Whispering Canyon, so what does Disney Food Blog think? Interesting, okay, how about the Diz? 
Okay, let's see what people have to say on the forums. Did I mention there are forums? There are forums. All of this research essentially becomes a game. Heck, Disney Food Blog's motto is literally, let's win Disney. Which means that you can lose Disney. And, let's face it, you can. The win state feels so nebulous and poorly defined, like all joy does in the long run. But losing? That feels so present. Like it's always nipping at your heels. There's so much to see. Too much to experience in a week or two weeks or five days. And the trip is so expensive. And you don't know the next time you'll be back. Or if you'll ever be back. So you go on a steady diet of as much Disney information as you can binge, and your YouTube recommends page starts looking like all you care about is Disney World. And you just try to soak up as much information as you can, so you can be prepared to win! But the thing that's so fascinating about all this noise is that it generally coalesces around the same points. They're all shouting the same things in slightly different voices. You're not being given unique or life-changing information with these videos so much as you're buying into the brand. The prepared Disney fan brand. And while it's totally fine to watch these videos as a way to plan and get excited for your trip, and I suggest that you do, they're really fun, there's something kind of dulling about the whole experience. It all converges to create a homogenous Disney opinion. The fan wisdom and groupthink are strong in the Disney parks fandom. There are correct restaurants, correct rides, correct snacks, and correct hotels. There are the wrong decisions that will ruin your trip. And sure, they're mostly right. It's pretty easy to pick out the truly standout experiences of Disney World, but it comes at the expense of yet another chunk of your discovery. In every good vacation, and every good experience, there's this push and pull of discovery and planning. But in this ecosystem of bingeable content, it inevitably leads to bingeable planning. And that planning is designed to keep you invested before, during, and after your trip. Because if you wait for next week's video, you'll get even more collective wisdom from those in the know, and then maybe you'll be in the know too. And these YouTubers are all hoping that you'll buy their premium guide, or use their travel agency, or donate to their Patreon. By the way, donate to my Patreon, please. And all of this is a soothing salve for the anxiety. You're not the first person to worry about this, and you certainly won't be the last. Look at all of these people online telling you that you're so right and so smart for being so prepared and watching their videos. And so you watch, and you start to make your list. I want to eat here, 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 and here. We're going to rope drop this day to hit Star Wars stuff before we get mobbed by the crowds. This meal costs two dining plan credits. This one costs one. This one will pay for out of pocket. You could go on. And your friends will want to beg you not to, but they're nice people who care about you, so they won't. If you're especially neurotic, you download and occasionally check the My Disney Experience app to keep an eye on wait times to get a sense of crowd levels. You stay up to date on the latest park news. Is the Skyliner a disaster? Is Star Wars Galaxy's Edge as big of a success as it needs to be? Who exactly is Bob Chapek and why is he bad? If you follow any of these sites, you find yourself learning, or at the very least hearing wild conjecture about theme park business minutia and park incidents, and you start to get the growing feeling that things are not like they used to be. And they're right. But it's Disney World, so you're still excited. And you still plan. Finally, the day has arrived. The first big checkpoint of your vacation. The dining day. 180 days out from your vacation. So, you've made your list. And you wake up at 5 a.m. ready to roll. 6 a.m. rolls around and the dining reservation window opens. You put your plan into action. Most of the reservations go the way you want them to. The big ones you may have to adjust, but it's done. And there's this huge sense of relief. You've passed the first gate. And from there, it's all spreadsheets and budgets and critiquing your plan with other obsessives and watching YouTube videos and counting down the days until your next big checkpoint, your 60-day fast pass window. So let's recap a bit. At this point, you know when you're going, what hotel you're staying at, what parks you're going to on what days, what you feel like eating on each of those particular days at each of those particular times, and now, what rides you want to ride and at what times of the day. But that system is, unfortunately, deeply convoluted. Each park has their own separate way of dealing with FastPass Plus. Some have tiers that limit the number of e-ticket attractions you can select. There I go, using jargon again. And the Magic Kingdom is more of a free-for-all. Nevertheless, there are win and loss states of FastPass Plus as well. Get your fast passes for too early in the day? Well, you're not taking advantage of sparse early day crowds, but you'll have more to choose from in the afternoon. Get them too late in the day? You won't be able to take advantage of the bonus fast passes that open up after you use your initial three. 
So you try to shoot for, say, the 11 to 2 range and hope that everything works out. But of course, there's always outliers when you book. Folks who are staying on site may be making their fast pass selections before you. But that's impossible, you cry. I too am staying on site. Ah, but those people arrived earlier than you. You try to book a fast pass for Flight of Passage, Animal Kingdom's genuinely breathtaking avatar simulator, but it isn't available at the time you want. This may be your first day and your first fast pass pick, but this is someone else's last day at the parks, and they have a seven day jump on you. So at the end of the day, there's no guarantee. It often winds up feeling like a cruel lottery. You can plan and strategize all you want, but if something's not available, there's nothing to be done. So you do the whole song and dance again. You wake up way too early, you pick out your fast passes, you win some, you lose others, and you start to crystallize the plan. And finally, it's mostly done. The next 60 days are when you let the whole thing become real. You're basically done at this point, but nothing's ever finished. There's always a tweak to be made, always another video to watch, another blog to read. Is all of this planning effective? I certainly hope so. When I get this deep into the weeds in planning a vacation, I like to call it bumper bowling. Sure, bumper bowling isn't skillful, but at the very least, you're not gonna get a gutter ball. You're gonna knock over something. How many you knock over, though? You won't know until you get there. Part of this video is regret. Regret mixed with ego served on a platform that'll let just anybody ramble about anything, unless it's deemed not commercially viable, so I guess it's been a nice run. But in that regret, I find truth. And the truth is this. I overplanned. And I'm addicted to overplanning. The bumper bowling I set up ended up feeling like goals to rush to or checkpoints to clear. Even on days when we'd scheduled less, it still felt like we were rushing from place to place, trying to physically see as much as possible in the day that we had. And while it certainly wasn't entirely their fault, the FastPass Plus system and the My Disney Experience app really contributed to that. It's extraordinarily cliche to go on a rant about phones, so I'm not going to do that. What I am going to do, though, is say that the My Disney Experience app is almost too tempting to check. There's so much data at your fingertips, and it makes it all too easy to switch and reconfigure plans at a moment's notice. Folks will sometimes complain about the app's functionality, but I found it to be almost too effective. It was my shoulder devil. I couldn't stop futzing with it. So we bounced from checkpoint to checkpoint, trying to min-max a Disney World run. Which isn't to say we didn't have fun. My wife and I had a great time. As great of a time as you can have when it's 90 degrees and near 100% humidity every single day of your trip. It's November, Florida. Get it together. We rode great rides, we snacked our way around the world at Epcot's Food and Wine Festival, and we made a ton of happy memories together. It was genuinely magical. There was some joy to be found in the successful completion of a meticulous year-long plan. It was a nice catharsis. But the best Disney World memories? The ones that I'll keep with me long after my Epcot t-shirt's moth-eaten, and my Trader Sam's collectible tiki mugs have started to gather dust? Those are born from those unexpected moments of discovery, that turn into life-affirming moments of joy. They're happy accidents, like winding up on your own private Skyliner car to find that it's a peaceful, beautiful, and above all, quiet place of tranquility. Or relaxing at night in a two-person hammock at the Polynesian while you wait for a table at Trader Sam's that may never come. Or an impromptu boat ride from Wilderness Lodge to the Contemporary at the end of a long day to discover that the Magic Kingdom's nightly fireworks show is in progress, and watching it from afar as it reflects serenely off the dark and silent lake. Disney World has the power to create both magic and malice. I've seen both close up. It's that heartwarming joy you feel when your wife gets to hug BB-8, but it's also the agony of the young parents with three little boys who just will not behave. I don't judge. At the very least, I try not to judge. I can't, because I get it. The pressure is enormous, as is the expense. The expectations are insurmountable, and Disney knows this, and they like it that way, because they could change it if they wanted to. The changes could be simple. Diminish the number of fast passes distributed, or only make them available in park the way they used to at Disneyland. They could even still use the app for that. They could allow for a greater number of same-day walk-up reservations at their restaurants. Increase unscheduled free-form in-park entertainment. Free up and reward guests for exploring the parks and resorts. Give them reasons to linger. Looking at you, Galaxy's Edge. Why change? Because there's something inherently worthwhile about the Disney World experience. It's beautiful to be able to slip into this temporary state of hyper-enjoyment, to experience an entire world designed from the ground up to be pleasurable to all of your senses. 
I go back to those planning tapes from my childhood. I look at the footage and I see the discovery. I see the magic and the wonder. And I go out and I search for it in the parks. It's still there. I still believe in it. And when you find it, scoop up as much of it as you can and take it home with you and make that joy last. Spread it thin like the last bit of jelly in the jar. Just enough for the flavor. I go to Disney World searching for wonder. Maybe one day I'll be able to find it without spending a year worrying. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell notification thing so you know when new videos pop up. And in the comments, let me know about your thoughts about Disney World and how you have overplanned or underplanned. And just let me know your thoughts about the episode. Next time, we're doing a Christmas theme. We're gonna be doing some Christmas tapes. It's gonna be exciting. If you have a dollar or more a month that you can spare on Patreon, it really goes a long way in helping me make this show. If you donate $20 a month, which, wow, you get your name here in the giant zone of giant power, and Chase Smith is the only member currently of the giant zone of giant power. If you donate $5 or more a month, you get your name here in the regular zone of regular power. It's still quite powerful though, and I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on Too Many Tapes. I built one of those fancy lightsabers, but it basically immediately broke, so now it's a very, very heavy paperweight.